I'm Paul Dickey, originally from Kansas. Uh, I graduated from Wichita State University in 1970. I uh, worked off for a master's degree at, uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, in history and philosophy of science. I uh, came to Omaha in the mid-80s with my wife and family. I uh, worked at uh, Mutual of Omaha uh, in uh, personal computer technology. I was, I was excited by the new microcomputer technology that was happening at the time. Uh, I've also worked at, uh, at Ameritrade. Was able to retire uh, from that, that kind of work though uh, in the late uh, uh, 90s. And, uh, and now I teach uh, part-time at Metropolitan Community College. I teach philosophy, introduction to philosophy, and critical thinking. Well, oh, clearly I'm a Plains poet. Um, you know, there's always the farm uh, houses and the, the wheat fields and the corn fields and all of that in, in the poem. Uh, I think also I've become somewhat of a Nebraska poet too, although maybe not quite as clear as, as the Plains poet. What it really interests me mostly though about the idea of geographical location and the identity is, is kind of a paradox. On the one hand, our identities as writers are very much often defined by the location in which we grew up, the location in which we live, the specific nature of our day-to-day -day experience. And, those, and that's very important. We wouldn't really be the individuals we are, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be the writers we are without that. On the other hand, if it was only that, then I think that something would be lost and it wouldn't be as important. I think what is most important is when that geographical location is able, without denying it, become more universal and more general. And one, one example I can give you of that is, I grew up in, in Kansas, uh, uh, my parents were Pentecostal fundamentalists, um, and we went to camp meetings. You know, speaking in other tongues was a big deal. Uh, and to me, the, some of the associations with that is wheat, uh, wheat fields, hot, swelty <laughs> July nights and days, uh, fireworks, canvas tents, it's very much, in my mind, a Kansas experience. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I wrote a poem that actually I wrote off and on for 30, 40 years, when I tried to deal with that subject in a poem, uh, guess who published that poem? Do you think it was the Prairie Schooner? Do you think it was the Kansas Quarterly? That poem was published by a journal whose explicit mission is to record the experience of the Caribbean. Yes, the Bahamas. The poem was published in an environment totally different than the environment, geographical location that I wrote it to. But that doesn't mean that the geographical identity of the poem was not significant. I, I still think it was, because it was only by coming through that geog geographical identity that you could begin to reach some level of communication that was universal. And I think she, this editor, was able to identify with the poem because I wrote it through a geographical identity, even though it was a very different geographical identity than her readers would relate to. It all kind of started uh, while I was an undergraduate at Wichita State. You know, these are these the hippie days. You know, we, we thought of writers as, you know, some kind of divine beings, in the, you know. The music we listened to continually reinforced metaphor, imagery, uh, message, meaning, and so on. So we were very attuned to lyrics and lyrical writing. And I was responding to that. I was impressed by that. Uh, I also had friends who were kind of wannabe writers, and I was always most impressed with those you know, who were literary and took literature, even though I was not taking much literature myself at the time. But eventually I said, okay, I'm gonna take a poetry workshop myself in 1968. And I was, that's really where it all began. My instructor was Michael Van Walligan, the, uh, a uh, young writer instructor um, at Wichita State at the time. And I was pretty sh shy, didn't have a lot of confidence in my abilities what I was doing there. I was in a literature major and so on. Uh, but uh, he really impressed me with uh, you know, some uh, 
credit that he gave me for my writing. He said some very good things about it. He encouraged me. And even more to the point, he introduced me to the work of his instructor, W.D. Snodgrass, who was a big name in the uh, confessional uh, school of poetry at the time, which really zined me, you know, because it, it, what I began to find was a, a very deep personal identity with Snodgrass's work. And it's almost like what Snodgrass wrote, it was like he had a mirror in, into me. He had like an, a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder taping me, and it's like everything seemed to be so personal that it really responded, and I just really got hooked at that time. As far as when did I begin to view myself as a writer, that's probably something that I even now still wonder about. Um, my uh, instructor, Bienvenido Santos, uh, uh, in this later that I had, was really the one, first one who called me that, that I began to say, wait a minute, if he says that, then there's really something to that. Because I always think of that as, as a somewhat arrogant uh, thing to uh, portray yourself as a writer, and uh, so I would avoid it. I, I know uh, Van Walligan said once that when he went to parties, he never introduced himself as a writer. He always said, I'm an English instructor because it's something people relate to. Writers people don't relate to. Okay. That can come from almost anywhere. You know, the language, uh, you know, a turn of, the la of a phrase that someone, you know, it's just something that you hear and put that in contrast with some metaphor or some image, and all of a sudden it, it just kind of gets you going. You know, gets you thinking, you know, there's some verbal cohesion that needs to be made out of this. Um, oftentimes I wake up with uh, some, some pretty strange uh, dreams, and uh, oftentimes that brings me into wanting to, mm -hmm. to create one of these prose poems that, that will create some kind of verbal coherence uh, to, what, to what I experienced. Ted Kuzer talks about getting up at five o'clock in the morning. I could never do that. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not a morning person. I don't have that, that kind of discipline uh, to do. And so I'm a very ad hoc kind of driven person. And I tend to write when something forces me to write because something just needs to get done and, and need to be said or, or needs to be discovered. Um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I had a long lapse in my writing careers because things in, in, intruded, distracted me from writing, and without some kind of, I'm gonna get up at five o'clock every day and keep pushing, I just kind of let it, let it go. So I kind of regret that in a way that I haven't been able to develop that. And I, I think I was told when I was taking the uh, MFA program classes that a mark of a real poet is one who defines his voice and, and establishes a voice. And so I always thought that would happen maybe someday. I don't think it has. I, you know, I think my uh, prose poetry and my lyrical poetry is really very different. The prose poetry is somewhat edgy. Uh, it, it uses humor. It, it will embrace po some politics, uh, whereas the, the free verse kind of work uh, is more image driven and could almost sometimes risk sentimentality. So I think those are very different and of course a lot of the other things I write, fiction, plays and so on, is entirely a different kind of thing. So I don't think that I have developed a single voice, it's more like a ventriloquism, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, is uh, Edgar Bergen's voice Charlie McCarthy or is it uh, Mortimer Snorg? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't uh, write uh, poetry for, uh, for an audience. I, I think that can be very dangerous. Although when I try to select poems for a collection or for reading, I do take very seriously the audience uh, because I think it's very, you know, it's very difficult to come to a public poetry reading and really make sense out of anything um, and have that as a valuable experience. So I tame, try to tame down a lot of the philosophical illusions, which I probably didn't do well enough today. Um, but I do, expect, I do expect an audience like this to be somewhat aware of 20th century literary history, and so I don't 
tone down as much the literary references. Fall in love with the language. Poetry is an act of language. The, the language is rich. The language is flexible. The language has so much charm. Work from the language. Don't work from thoughts or ideas. It's not about, I have something I want to say and finding a poem to say it. You know, I'm, I'm a teacher of critical thinking. And if you have a good idea, the best way to do that is by presenting a logical argument in prose. If you have something to say, that's the way to deal with ideas. But for poet, worry about the language. Play with the language. Let, you know, just fall in love with the language. I would recommend actually three, um, three items to read. Uh, first of all, one, of the, um, one thing that had a lot of impact on me was Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet as well as Snodgrass's um, essay, Tact in the Poet's Force, and Victor Hugo's book, The Triggering Town. You should probably read those three every six months, just to keep you in. So, and some of that may be somewhat old-fashioned uh, anymore, but it works for me. You know, I think those I think are very, three very important things. Work. And of course, as everybody says, read a lot of poetry, both the old masters and current stuff. You know, fifth, uh, you know, read Prairie Schooner. If you like prose poetry, read Sentence. You know, read. Well, good afternoon. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I'm the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John H. Ames Reading Series. We're excited that this reading series has been in existence for more than 25 years, and that this is the 203rd reading. So thank you for being here. We are in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It's a special collection that's dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection. Obviously, we don't have everything, but um, we have about 13,000 volumes at this point by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. And we do have information files and magazines, pictures, manuscripts. Um, if you look around the room, you'll see some artwork um, related to Nebraska authors as well and other memorabilia. And by the way, I just want you to know that the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. And we would like to thank the NLHA for their endowment, for the endowment that was established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And we would also like to thank those who contributed to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund during a recent campaign. We do invite you to visit the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and on Sundays from 2 to 5. And of course, we're open right now because here we are in the Heritage Room doing the Ames reading during the public service hours. Um, the Ames readings are also filmed by Five City TV. And if you're not here in the Heritage Room today and you're watching this on Channel 5 or on the um, On Demand, we're, we are located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library at 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln. And we have the Ames readings currently on the third Sunday of the month at 2 p.m. So our reader today is Paul Dickey. He was born in Kansas. But we, we probably won't hold that against him, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but he's lived in Omaha since 1985, I think, so he's, he's a pretty long time Nebraskan too. His degrees in uh, psychology and mathematics from Wichita State University, and the history and philosophy of science from Indiana University, Bloomington. He is also interested in writing as well. He's written poetry, fiction, short nonfiction, and plays. He has a poem that was published in Nebraska Presence, I know. A Nebraska Presence, an anthology of poetry, and it's a poem called Constellation. His latest book is titled, They Say This Is How Death Came Into the World. It was published in 2011. So we're very happy to have Paul here with us today. And if you could help me welcome him, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Meredith. Good afternoon. 
I'm pleased to be reading today in Lincoln at this prestigious reading series, um, and uh, I will be reading primarily from my 2011 book, They Say This Is How Death Came Into the World, that was published by May Apple Press. Um, the book is composed of three sections, like a sandwich. Um, what we have are two slices of rye or pineapple pumpernickel bread, which is like prose poetry. And between them we have a filling of linear, low diet, uh, beef and chicken and turkey and that kind of thing. Now if you listen carefully to what I just said, you probably already know something about what to expect from my poems. And that is, I don't mind slinging a lot of metaphors around, sometimes even inappropriately, particularly when you don't expect them. Uh, and I'm somewhat devilish, uh, trying to pull off things that uh, uh, you might not have expected. Uh, so you kind of want to watch for that. I like to describe the poems as sort of a calculus. I have a bit of a mathematical background, and it's sort of a calculus. And I call it the limit of the human as meaning approaches infinity, or approaches zero um, at times. Okay, now, if you read very much prose poem, you, poetry, you know that a prose poem is often a contradiction in terms, or is often thought of as a contradiction in terms. We know what prose is, and that's not what poetry is. So how can there be such an animal as a prose poem? Um, and it makes and that objection does make some sense. However, when you actually observe a poem and you observe some of the history of the way certain poets have approached poetry, you'll see that there can be a kind of an interesting merger that, that does occur. For example, Charles Baudelaire, a French symbolist poet, uh, is one of our more traditional classical uh, poets that we think of as uh, starting the 20th century heritage of prose poetry. And what uh, Baudelaire liked to claim and what he was liked to search for is a musicality in poems by throwing away the rhythm and the meter, which is kind of uh, paradoxical. Stephen Crane in the early 20th century was thought and is actually accused by the uh, crit critic um, William Dean Howells as a prose poet, but what he wrote was mostly what we later came to call free verse, and it was called prose poetry primarily just because it broke up the lines, didn't have the met meter, and so on. But what we see in both Baudelaire and Crane, we see something that screams out to us in terms of metaphor, in terms of image, in terms of intensity, something that screams to be poetry, but it doesn't look like poetry. And that's why kind of people have gotten very interested in doing that in the 20th century in prose poetry. What, we, what you usually see now is called a prose poem, if you read uh, the, the journals that publish prose poetry, is you see the poetry in sentences and paragraphs. You know, like a poem is like three paragraphs. Uh, it doesn't look any different than a flash fiction. But th there's a difference, and the difference is in terms of the craft that uh, applies to that. But anyway, to actually to define what prose poetry is, is a bit like chasing your tail. But I, I'm gonna read some of, you, uh, some of my prose poems to you and see if you can kind of get a, an idea of, uh, of what I'm kind of looking at and what, what, how I kind of work with that. The first poem I'm going to read is entitled, A Bad Break. The poem is a baseball poem. I write a lot of baseball poems. And the poem refers to Lou Gehrig, the legendary first baseman for the New York Yankees, who died from a crippling illness, which of course bears his name. After a career in which he played in a consecutive number, 2130 games, Gra a great act of 
participation, um, as opposed to, you'll, you'll hear Joe DiMaggio mentioned in the poem. Joe DiMaggio is known for the longest hitting streak, the difference between participation and engagement. Louis Ge Lou Gehrig said to a New York Yankee Stadium crowd that was honoring him after his illness had been uh, identified and, and he had a prognosis. Fans, for the past two weeks you have been reading about a bad break. I got. Yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. So it kind of screams out to ask us, what is that all about? What is that all about? Where's the humanity? And I hope I've captured some of that humanity in this poem. It's a prose poem, a bad break. Lou Gehrig is crying. Lou Gehrig is crying for every story in New York City. Lou Gehrig is wiping down every bleacher seat in Yankee Stadium with his salt. Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig, he has the right. He banged everyone with a dinner. DiMaggio can't believe the greatest ball player he's ever played with is crying. Gehrig once hit behind Babe. Lou Gehrig is crying. It fills every stein and mug in the Bronx. Gehrig wanted to play in every game. DiMaggio wants a hit in every game. DiMaggio carries a bomb who will sleep with the president. Lou Gehrig is crying up and down Broadway. He just got a bad break. He says he is the luckiest man in the world. The babe and Gehrig are hugging like sisters. They don't speak to each other. Gehrig's mother said something about Babe's wife. Lou Gehrig is crying. DiMaggio still loves Marilyn. He has laid flowers on her grave. They were going to be married again. Lou Gehrig is crying. Lou Gehrig is crying down at the financial district where someday the big bucks will build our future at the World Trade Center. Casey says DiMaggio won't play ball if he can't play ball the way people expect Joe DiMaggio to play ball, and it's only to take the money. Joe DiMaggio is an American hero. DiMaggio's father's name was Giuseppe in San Francisco, in 1942, that took guts. Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio. Now the commerce kid, like Babe, wants to hit a home run off every broad in the city. His dad, Mutt, gave him a baseball when he was hours old. But sometimes Mickey Charles preferred a bottle. The Mick needs your liver now. He and Billy and Whitey, for a while, drank up all of Gehrig's tears. Say, so, was anyone here uh, a couple weeks back at New York Giants or an Eli Manning fan? Well, this next poem is about the Super Bowl. It probably, though, is more in the voice of Tim Tebow's God. And I hope you find that the poem really, though, is more than just about football. And maybe it's even about the scientific method. This poem is entitled, How Galileo Scored His Ticket to the Super Bowl. It would have been easy, son. All you needed was to call my hotline. 1-800-GOD-GAME. Tell them you know Cosmiki de Medici, Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Everybody understands. They take your word on faith. 
No one asks for an explanation. The tickets arrive by miracle. You get few level skyboxes at the sun of the universe with Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Pope Urban VIII. But no, he can't. I forgot, he is Galileo. He wants a certain and reputable methodology. He won't leave well enough alone. He demands a chair for his old high school, school buddy Copernicus. He wants physics to be a new science. Galileo turns his back on me and orbits all alone around the domed stadium, putting all his faith in scalpers. Copernicus couldn't even come. He said something about an inquisition, whatever that is. He might be under house arrest. Or maybe he just said that he didn't want to be an imposition. I got your scientific method, method right here in my fist, bub. It's one of his former pupils from Padua, now a businessman. Galileo will do anything, will take anything, even the nosebleed section, studying all the action by telescope. He observes that the players' numbers are sunspots. He demands an explanation from anyone who will listen. He won't leave well enough alone. He wants a mathematical proof. Stadium security explains the rules. It is nothing personal. There was no reason for a disturbance. Reason? Galileo laughs. And the next prose poem has uh, kind of several unsavory-like characters, characters such as my image of myself, my wife's image of me, her image of me, my image of her. Those kind of an unsavory characters are throughout this poem. This poem is entitled, uh, entitled Images Of. My wife's image of me and my image of myself met for a drink and to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. We were going to get things ironed out. But at the club, we bumped into the lovers, my image of her and her image of herself who surely were not expecting to see us. They were with their boyfriends, her image of him and his image of himself. His image of himself said something rude to my image of myself and thus seemed to be in cahoots with my wife's image of me. My image of her seemed to be embarrassed and ashamed of my image of myself, and then went home with her image of me. His image of her walked in the door at that time and wanted to have it out with anyone who wanted to have it out with them. The only one that did was my image of her. My wife and I arrived shortly thereafter and left right away because of all the confusion. If at all possible, I particularly wanted to avoid running into my wife's image of herself. Now, you probably don't hear frequently poems about the scientific method, and since I've already read one, I think I'll read a second one. This poem is entitled, The Seeker of Truth. There's probably some characters in here you, you will recognize, too. Sir Isaac Newton, the chairman of the board, fumed. You think you can do a leveraged buyout of the freaking scientific method? 
the next thing you know, for God's sake, you'll be pitching the big bucks for truth itself. Rupert chuckled to himself. Yeah, he did. Newton was right on the apple, so to speak. He had already bought out journalism for a bit near $5 billion. Why not science? And that would be the first step to buying out the whole of truth and reality. The whole shebang. It wasn't such a far out notion. Epistemology was already on the block for next quarter. He just needed a few swing votes on the board. He had a power lunch tomorrow with David Hume, and he had hired some ladies in the and he'd hired some ladies to take Descartes out for a night in Paris and blow out his candle. The next poem is the title poem from the book. They say this is how death came into the world. There's a couple characters in here that you'll recognize, Mercy and Grace, twin sisters, of course. Um, Grace, of course, is uh, what we all usually think is a blessing coming from God that we do not deserve. It is getting what we don't deserve. And mercy is kind of the reverse. It is not getting what you do deserve. Okay? They say this is how death came into the world. Peter and I saw Grace and her twin sister Mercy in the coffee and juice shop this morning. Mercy says that with their cousin, surely goodness, they are to follow me all the days of my life. But I hadn't seen either one of them since high school. And Sunday youth group, when we had to hear the preacher spew forth his expertise on sin and hellfire. Peter says a few years later, Preach had lust with one of them, who was then church organist, 30 years his longer, younger. The wife cried at the divorce just when the audience was about to split, the television audience. He, was, he married one of them. It was grace, I think, but maybe it was mercy. Now he has peace in his soul. Everyone has their own salvation. I go up my own coffee into my own body. I have no job, no prospects. I shall dwell in the house of my father forever. I follow them to the waiting stretch limo. Shirley G. is not going to show with the cash for the Lord and me to make a down payment. Should I plead my cause to the driver of St. Augustine, but with only my puny original sin caught in my throat, for goodness sakes, would it do any good? Um, so those are prose poems. Um, if you look at them on the page, you wouldn't distinguish them from flash fictions or just short little essays. Uh, but I hope you saw something in that that kind of struck you as why I would bother to call those poems. And, we would, and, we, and uh, people deal with uh, prose poetry. Now, but sometimes some of the tools that we normally see in poetry, like imagery and sound and that kind of things, when you're writing a prose poem, kind of stretches into other techniques, techniques that you're more familiar with in terms of fiction or prose, like narrative or character. So I don't think there's a lot of character built in those poems. And so at times when I'm trying to write a prose poem, of, 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 well, I don't actually try to write a prose poem. What, what I'm writing, and I think it's a prose poem, it really turns into more of a flash fiction. And I'm sliding over that line all the time, and I'm not really sure oftentimes uh, where I'm at on that. Here's a, here's, I'm going to read three now that are really kind of a little bit further along towards narrative 
uh, than those will. But still, I still got to be in the book as prose poems. The Experienced Couple. Jack had peddled the metal halfway home through the Hampshires. Do you want the radio on? He asked Sue. I don't care, dear. Do you? I asked you if you did. I really don't mind if you do. It doesn't matter to me. Well then, do or don't. There was silence. He did nothing. Sue asked her husband if he was warm. Warm enough, I'd say. She said, does that mean you would like it warmer? If you want it warmer, he said. Oh, no, I'm warm enough, she said. She did nothing. He asked, would you like a bite to eat? She perked up. Would you like something yourself, dear? There's a lovely sandwich shop up the road just a few miles, I think. I could drive further or not, he said. Whatever pleases you, she said. It's just whatever you want, dear. Jack drove on. Jack was cold and hungry, wanted to hear music. Sue was cold and hungry, wanted to hear music. Well, the opportunities we miss in our lives. This is entitled Dad's Shoestrings. Dad's Shoestrings. Peter's sister tells this story. He does not know if it is true, nor how she knows. Their father was on the bench. He was in eighth grade, and it was the last year he would be good enough to make the team. Already he played only when the game was decided, absolutely won or hopelessly lost. Like the night Peter woke him up to say he was leaving school to get married. It was too late. A dad couldn't do anything about it. It was the game against, sometimes she says Kiowa, sometimes she says Cherokee. Midway through the first half, the score was tied. With plenty of time left, the, the game might be won early, and Dad could get his minutes. Virgil Schwetfiger's shoelace broke. His shoe fell off. The coach looked down the bench for a replacement. The girls with pom-poms gasped. Their father wanted to play just once, while the outcome was still in doubt. In five years, he would marry his sweetheart in Enid. Afterwards, there was a baby, and another baby, and another. Jack, quick, give your shoestrings to Virgil, the coach yelled. And that is what my father later did for a living. Lennon and McCartney. This is um, the type of uh, piece where you imagine what would have happened had not what happened had gotten the way and interfered. What would have happened? Lennon and McCartney. 62-year-old Paul McCartney, a bankrupt businessman of Liverpool, strolled down Penny Lane watching children laugh behind the back of a banker with a motor car. He worried how he was going to pay the rent due next week on his flat across the hall from Father McKenzie. He carried an old transistor radio that he had pilfered from the junk shop down by Strawberry Fields. It was all he had now on which to listen to the BBC. A new tune came on the waves and he quickly flicked it off. He didn't want to listen to it. He remembered 
when he was a lad listening to the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly. Now that was music. But the music just didn't go anywhere after a while, and Mr. McCartney had to get on in business, though now that had failed him too. Besides Holly, he had liked that bloke Bob Dylan, but American folk music got old, and Dylan by himself couldn't take it anywhere modern. If only Paul had listened to his mom, who had wanted Polly himself to take music lessons. He laughed. Maybe he could have merged Dylan's stuff together with the Everleys. Then the music would have gone somewhere. And not that tinny, tinny stuff you hear on the BBC these days. But Paul knew you could drive yourself crazy wondering about what could have been. He crossed paths momentarily that day with one John Lennon, aged 64, an unkempt street painter, losing his hair, with birthday greetings and a bottle of wine in his pocket. Twenty quid for a portrait, sir? Paul McCartney wasn't used to being called sir. And he thought about it, but he didn't have the 20 quid. The two of them were wearing raincoats. Mr. Lennon, however, was walking down Abbey Road whistling. He was on his way home. It was October. It was the year 2004. And John Lennon was simply happy to be alive. In addition to prose poetry, I also write more lyrical poetry in which I'm interested in um, the images more. I'm interested more in epiphany. You know, an epiphany is when you have a sudden realization. I love the kinds of poems that you kind of start off reading, and it's like you're reading a newspaper, like nothing much is going on here. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in a completely different world and all of a sudden, everything has changed. Uh, That's an epiphany. Uh, Let me read you a few of these. Uh, The first one is somewhere once a house. We could have lived anywhere. Strung light and power around a tree. You could have dried your hair. We made money in the wind, caught for a minute on limbs, and blew away. Yes, dear, perhaps we sinned, arguing which debt could go first or which stay years, proposed bets until our pockets were bare, invited birds to spend the night, to nestle in your blouse whipped into rags by a clothesline while we slept. But no, we lived in this house. Boys who did not return. In the distance across this field, the range of a good shotgun I see the austere angles of roof of the Mennonite church above the winter wheat and an unexpected eagle in a tortured cottonwood. My mind composes itself with the material world next to me, shattered glass of the chicken coop, a rotting baseball all things hidden in his hayloft, every object a boy can imagine and those he can't. Mostly things that make no sense are found here. Crushed plastic, a dented tin drinking cup, a rubber soldier, rusty nails, a farmhouse.
The next poem is entitled Jigsaw Puzzle. Some of us are old enough to remember putting together jigsaw puzzles as entertainment. Uh, young people don't seem to remember that too well. But anyway, jigsaw puzzle. Be careful the curves do not deceive you. There is one way for this landscape to fit. First, Work the straight edges only. Complete the solid blue and green, the border, ground, and sky before you risk a difficult discussion of ambiguous color. That is her piece, your piece, her piece again. Yet that is where Golden saxifrages appear, a villa at Timberline where lovers meet. A Man Spelunking. This has a prologue, uh, it's a quote from uh, Mark Twain. The memory of a cave I used to know was always in my mind with its lofty passages, its silence and solitude, its shrouding gloom, it, its sceptical echoes, its fleeting lights, and more than all, its sudden revelations. That's in uh, Innocence Abroad. This book, the poem is entitled A Man Spelunking. It starts out in the voice of a tour guide. Ladies and gentlemen, Notice when entering how the cave invites you, as a lady might ask you to dine. Infatuated, we crowded down the gangly stairs, looked up to see a ragged octagon of sky being lost. This is how a home closes in on you. Rock caresses rock. Bats exhibit technology. We walked nearly blind, one foot after another, into an unknown. Our fingers traced curves of wet clay, well worn by previous parties. At the bedrock, floodlights caused the room to echo with awe, as from fireworks. From where the water comes is not known, nor how many centuries it had dripped before being found by a miner exploring only for gold. The guide tells how a man became lucky, chiseling randomly at rock he heard a distant slosh, thought it sounded like a woman soaking in a bubble bath. Solid walls challenged him, but he cut out a tunnel, first traced by a trickle and wiggled through. He couldn't believe what he saw, only with his flashlight. She was singing. I'll read one more of these, uh, delivering to the client. And um, I actually have a presence for everybody. On the table, there is a broadside of this poem that you're free to take with you, complimentary. Uh, but if you want to donate to the Heritage Room, that's fine too. <laughs> uh, but you don't have to leave any money to take one of the broadsides. Uh, the, the poem is first published in the Mid-American Review, um, and it's being republished as a broadside by uh, broadsidedpress.org. And they do this like once a month. And actually this is for April, so I'm giving you kind of a peak preview of it, okay? Um, delivering to the client. It's a technology poem. All afternoon within the cubicles, it has been raining requirements. 
code meanders down screens, a river depositing content to reservoirs of large cities. The river is muddy. Testers look for unintended consequences. Silt, small towns from nowhere, on the banks sapping resources, or driftwood and beavers filling dams. Their will is to break everything, but they could still miss the isolated farmstead where a man in the rain works on a tractor in the field. Inside the man is a boy, insisting that tomorrow, when it stops raining, he is going fishing. Okay, the book uh, came out about a year ago. So most of these poems are poems that have been written like within the last two years. Uh, some of them much longer than that. I'd like to give you though an idea of um, s some of the poems that I have been writing more recently. Uh, but, but you will see the same kind of two different directions and trends. You see the prose poetry as well as you see some uh, lyrical uh, poems. The first one is entitled, We Never Know. Um, the poem is, uh, will be published in the Prairie Schooner this summer, We Never Know. We never know what energy burns in the light across the road, slips through the drapes, or maybe borrows light from our house. And maybe there is no motion of atoms between the chairs in a small room of our neighbors, as there is no motion sometimes between you and me. We speak and laugh almost daily over fences. There is light in our eyes, and when it escapes, we know we never knew. Uh, the next poem that I'll read is entitled, Neither Father Nor Lover. Now you probably, how many is familiar with that phrase? It's from a poem by Theodore Ruthke. Uh, Theodore Ruthke's, Ruthke is somewhat of a hero of mine. Um, and in Ruthke's famous poem, Elegy for Jane, My Student Thrown by a Horse. So it's sort of a love poem of the professor for his student who had suffered a riding accident. Um, and in that, we had the phrase, neither father nor lover. Because um, the poem concludes with that line. I with no rights in this matter, neither father nor lover. So, so this poem it kind of tries to have a conversation on, on that topic and on that level. Uh, the poem refers to do -si dos Now you're probably familiar with the term as it's used in square dancing. Uh, and it's a circular movement where two people initially face each other, then walk around each other without or almost without turning. So that's one meaning of do -si do that, that I, want, I want you to understand uh, while you're listening to the poem. I also want you to, uh, to know also that the do -si do is the name of the Girl Scout cookies peanut butter sandwich cookie. That's also called a do -si do The poem has a prologue, and it's from, again, Elegy for Jane. The sides of wet stones cannot console me. The poem starts out with some beetle, beetles images uh, and some phrases that kind of sets it off as beetles things, and hopefully those kind of morph into Ruthke. Neither father nor lover. There's a knock on your door or in your mind. You see her standing there. She was just 17. 
now 64, frumpy, but looking way beyond compare. You wonder if you should let her in, and then you remember something more. She was not just a Beatles girl. She was that Rothke girl that made your life what it wasn't to be for 40 years. You know, the one with the quick look and the sidelong pickerel smile, which unbelievably she still has. But believe me, this woman has not just fallen off a horse. Another poet spoke of her. She descended many a staircase, both nude and partially nude. You have to give her that. And still, those neck curls, limp and damp as tendrils, and the skittery pigeon. Maybe she wants to give you everything she denied before her wedding because she was sleepy, or her father or her lover would be home any minute. That is history now. She laughs, then changes her mind. All of a sudden, she says she is selling magazines. She is at the wrong house. She tells you that if you had had that daughter with her all those years ago, she would have boxes of cookies to sell. Even the do -si dos you ask, you realize what you have said. You don't want to embarrass her. Your life has been good. No one should hoard more than one. You apologize all over yourself. Explain that you didn't mean it that way. It just slipped out. You know, the peanut butter sandwich ones. Yes, she says, even those. And we're going to do a poem for Theodore Ruthke. We probably should do one for Emily Dickinson, too. This poem is entitled, A Door Just Opened in a Mind, for Emily, Occupation at Home. No one knows doors better than her. Perhaps a piano in a parlor on the other side. Beyond the shadows of a hallway, house visitors sat in a corner, or with her they had a conversation behind one, partially closed. So no one wrote doors better than her. A door just opened on a street. Noon is the hinge of day. With just the door ajar, mortality's ground floor is immortality. The opening and the close of being and the heart has many doors. Taurus to the homestead now. We see a grand portal, neither inner nor outer, let's say both. And after all the years, beyond the shadows of a hallway and all of its ecstasy and circumference, through this door, we go in and we go out. The door just opened in the mind. Uh, most, as I'm sure, I hope you hope you re uh, recognize all of those lines in the middle stanza. In the middle there, were from Emily Dickinson. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me finish with a couple of prose poems that I've written since the book. The first one's entitled, Wake Up Little Susie. Uh, 
following up on the uh, Everly Brothers theme, right? Okay. Uh, wake up, little Susie. I answered the Craigslist ad, and it turned out I was buying the used car from Don Everly of the Everly Brothers. Don lives in Shenandoah, Iowa again now, and is 75. He explained the car was the one he drove back in the day when he took out little Susie to the movies. I knew it had sentimental value for him, but I was determined to get a good prize. Don, I said, you've got to be kidding. In your head, you're still dating that little tramp? You don't want to die just being remembered for that. Don calls me Paul, although we hadn't seen each other for years. Paul, what do you yourself figure that it's worth? Phil says it's an antique, a collectible, and worth a pretty penny. I felt a little weird negotiating the price of a used car with Don Everly, one of the finest rhythm guitar players in the history of rock and roll. But I hadn't listened to a single Everly Brothers record for 35 years, and I was sure that he would know that. He would also know that I had betrayed his music like a Judas once I got into high school, fell head over heels for the Beatles like everybody else, and that I had bought into Rolling Stone's view that his lyrics were obviously no match for Leonard Cohen, yet alone Bob Dylan. And even worse, I'm sure he suspected that I had sided with Phil when the brothers broke up for a decade in the 70s and hardly spoke to each other at the Father Ike's funeral. Paul, you see, Phil and I want to get back together again for good before we go. And funny, it all hinges on getting rid of this old jalopy. Sure, you understand that, and you'll help us out. But of course, we need to get out of her what she's worth. Fair is fair. That is all I ever wanted Phil and Daddy to admit. The way I figure, no offense, but you've had your good life coasting off Phil's and my harmonies and rhythm. Probably you got a little action yourself in the back seat of a car just like this one with girls, girls, girls blaring on the radio. That all still has to be worth something. You have money now, he said to me. And Phil and I, well, we are just washed up country and rock stars. It's time for payback. I didn't know what to say. But before I bought his story, I asked him again if everything, you know, the car, the girls, the fame and all, is worth it. And the last uh, prose poem that I'll read, which is it's a bit political, uh, but um, we live in we live in some pretty threatening political times, I'm afraid. Closing plants, still manufacturing, Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. They say America is not the manufacturing superpower it once was. Bottom line, Harry and Ike are not creating the new jobs they promised America. Businesses say, in the day, President Harry S. Truman was madder. He was a solid at room temperature, a concrete brick with drilled and engineered holes used to build skyscrapers. As was Dwight David Eisenhower. They had mass and occupied clearly defined space. They traveled at a given and predictable rate of speed, 
You could recognize photographs of them and not mistake them for Bridget Bordeaux or Sophia Loren. Today, Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower are liquids. The volume remains fixed, though you are not sure where they stand on the war, health care, or the national debt. The photos are digital. Sometimes they look like Paris Hilton, and sometimes they look like Miley Cyrus. Their shape is that of the container in which they are contained. Their particles are free to move about the cabin. Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower soon will be nothing but vapors of gas. They are no longer at room temperature. The volume of a gas is negotiable in a cigar-filled back room at the convention. It will not attach virtual images to the spam. It still takes up space, although the particles are uniformly distributed in air. You can friend Harry Ike on Facebook, but their websites inflict your hard drive with cookies and Trojans. The media mistakes them for ladies who are no ladies and without names you, can, you may call them in public. In the future, our young people will have to find jobs making something other than Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate you all coming. Thank <laughs> you.